and uh, first and foremost, a warm welcome. Thank you very much indeed for joining us wherever you are in the world. This is the seventh webinar in our Security Thought Leadership series. Every Tuesday and Thursday, don't forget, where we take a topic and we invite a panel to discuss the issues. And the reason we do that is because what is crystal clear is the type of security we get in the future will depend not in no small part on the quality of debate we have about those issues now. And today's topic, security in the news, what impressions are we getting, um, is formed through the issues that have cropped up in the previous six, where it has been commonly noted that in a crisis, it's the opportunity for the security sector to shine. And the question is, is it, and do people know about it? And today I've got an elite panel from around the world, United States, South Africa, and the United Kingdom, three people at the forefront of communicating news. Um, one question I would like to just address to all of you, please could you use the um, question and answer button at the bottom of your screen if you want to ask a question, and I will endeavor to get to it or include it in the questions that come up afterwards. That's the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Please put your questions there. Um, so I'm going to ask each of the panel to introduce themselves and once all three have done that I will then ask them to make their opening statement. So let's get started. Let me go to Chuck first. Hi everybody, I'm Chuck Harold. I host a show called securityguytv.com which you can find on live stream and all across the web. Thank you Chuck and Andrew. Thank you, Andrew Selden here. I'm the editor of High Tech Security Solutions based in South Africa and serving the Southern African region. Thank you, and Brian. Brian hasn't got a camera, but um, um, trust me, Brian Sims is there. Brian, over to you. Hi, Martin. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Brian Sims. I'm the editor of Security Matters magazine, which is one of the journals published by Western Business Media. I've been a professional journalist for the last three decades since I left university, and for the last 20 of those, I've written on security. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Brian. So what I'm going to do now is go to each of the panel and ask them for their opening statement. Chuck, you first, please. Martin, thanks for having me. I, I find this uh, topic fascinating, and I think it's spot on, as they say, across the pond. Um, I have always had an impression of security uh, a little different, I think, than most people. I started as a police officer over 35 years ago, worked for three agencies in California that I went uh ran studio security for Fox and Disney, and then I ran three guard companies for about 10 years, uh, of which five were the Academy Awards. So I understand security and guards and people. Here's my thoughts. Really, when it comes down to it, we're not protecting things anymore. We're trying to protect people, right? So to that point, all security is personal, all security is local, and all security is now. So what do I mean by that? There's nobody can make you safer than yourself, right? you know what makes you safe. And if you're acting responsibly and the guy next to you is acting responsibly and so on, that chain continues, your circle is safe. It's not about somebody doing that for you. Somebody can't protect you that way. You have to act responsibly. When I say it's local, I mean that FBI, local police, you know, MI5, they're only making us safer in a broad sense at the worldview. But really, locally, you're the one that has to take care of what's going on in your space. And again, if everybody took care of your space and your behavior, it's gonna work. And I'm gonna say this is the most important part. It's all now. We can't say, you know what? We're gonna wait for security to respond. We're gonna wait to respond to that question. We're gonna, we're gonna take a week and we're gonna say, let's think about that and have a meeting and a seminar and decide what to do. You gotta act, you gotta act now, or you don't act, but not acting is also an action, right? So I think the problem, uh, Martin, and I think it's really topical now, is that we're not seeing this application. We're seeing people looking to security for answers in this crisis. Security is, for the most part, quiet, or people aren't asking their opinion, which I think is a bigger mistake. And so I think the discussion today is really going to be interesting because these questions you've posed are crucial to not what's going on now, but where are we going to be six months a year, two years from now. That's what we need to answer. And if we don't address that question, we're going to have a big problem in the future. Chuck, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Andrew, your opening statement, please. Thank you, Martin. Appreciate it. I, I have to agree with uh, Chuck that uh, security today is personal. It's all about people. And uh, 
I have to say that during the lockdown in South Africa, we have actually seen both positive and negative aspects of security. The impression of the state uh, security mechanisms is probably lower than it's uh, ever been, uh, primarily because uh, the military is out on the streets, so we're in kind of a, a state of emergency, I guess. Um, on the other hand, on the positive side, we're seeing that the private security industry has really uh, taken up the mantle and as some people have been saying that they're not just doing their jobs, they're going, they're doing the extra yards. They're helping people, they're helping distribute uh, uh, sanitizer and what have you, um, helping people or encouraging people to maintain, maintain social distancing while still acting in their traditional security uh, kind of role. So from that perspective, uh, they've been doing very well. Unfortunately for security, um, the, what, the, what the state authorities do is, tends to be how people view security and uh, private security kind of gets lumped into that overall opinion. So that's not very good. And the private security industry is not very good at telling people what it's doing or, or celebrating its successes. So we're seeing a case of where you know, security is really... Uh, let me just say, not everyone's favorite uh, topic at the moment, uh, down here anyway, but uh, you are seeing successes and, and wins for security in smaller areas in local environments uh, on a personal scale, where everyone from the, from the guards, uh, you know, the, the officer on patrol or the armed response officer, through to the leaders, the CEOs of the companies and the security directors are actually getting involved, getting out there, uh, being visible and in their small environment, they're actually uh, creating a very good impression and actually doing a great job. Obviously, I'm generalizing, not everyone's on that level, but um, from a private security perspective, we're seeing pretty good uh, 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 work being done in South Africa at the moment. But as I say, unfortunately, we're all painted with a brush of what's happening on the uh, state level. So the state security operators are, well, let's just say they that uh, they dropped the ball. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. And finally, let me come to Brian Sims. And just to remind you, Brian, his camera's not working, so you'll hear just his voice. Brian, over to you. Thank you, Martin. Obviously, I'm coming from the UK perspective, and I've addressed the, the questions, the, the, the areas that you've actually put in your, your pre-webinar blurb, as it were. So what impressions of the security sector are being formed? Well, in the UK, I think, by and large, they're good ones. And I think much of the credit for this has to be down to the brave uh, frontline staff, of course, who are working on a daily basis. Um, and praise also for the security companies who are assisting them in, in their endeavours going forward. Um, I'd also say it's hugely important to mention here the drive by the BSIA, the NSI, the SSIAB, among others, uh, including the SIA, the regulator, uh, to see personnel re recognised as key and critical workers. Now, to my mind, they are. And that status should have been there, in my view, a long time ago. It shouldn't have taken a pandemic for the politicians and others to recognise this. Uh, another key point to make, I think, is stakeholders. Uh, they will be seeing security in a positive light just now. And many businesses out there are struggling during the lockdown, but they know their premises are being well and ably protected by security officers who are trained and licensed. Uh, what, in terms of what needs to happen for security to be shown uh, as being effective, I think that over many years now, the security industry has been uh, great at uh, preaching to the converted, shall we say. I think the messages have been excellent, but have we perhaps been guilty, and alluding to what Andrew said just a few seconds ago, have we been guilty about telling ourselves how good we are and not reaching out enough to the wider business community? I'd also say in this day and age, security must make its business case now more than ever. I think uh, service buyers who are paying what is good money for a solution still want to see how security does its job but they also want to see how it impacts in a positive way on the bottom line. That's crucial in this day and age, and even more so now during a pandemic. I think security in the top line has to become a business enabler right across the board. Brian, thank you very much indeed. Um, okay, uh, um, let me go back to my panel. Since you're all at that intersection between the security sector and the public, um, you've all painted a somewhat positive picture generally with Andrew's reservations but on a previous webinar it was put across a bit like Brian's point security is good at talking to itself but actually if you go to members of the public to government and to key stakeholders they're none the wiser and uh, they're not saying wonderful things they're just being neutral they, they haven't heard 
Um, is that your fault in the, in the security media, so to speak, that um, um, you're missing a trick to uh, speak up on behalf of the sector? Let me come to Andrew Seldon first. Thank you. Um, we, the security industry definitely is missing a trick uh, when it comes to telling their story and celebrating their wins. Um, we, it's, it's a case of uh, security was always, uh, you know, the guy who works behind the scenes and you only see him when you drive into a garage or, you know, enter a building or an estate or something. And uh, seen and not heard is, is kind of what people expected. But today we're seeing a lot of uh, private security companies adding uh, public relations courses to their, uh, the courses their, their, their offices uh, go on to enable them to deal better with people on the ground level and up through to management so that security management can have a better uh, opinion or, or better interface with their, with their bosses and the board. So they know that they need to talk about what they're doing and celebrate their successes or make it known. But uh, actually getting to that level where they actually talk openly and equally at a management or an executive level, I think we've still got a bit of a way to go there. Brian, let me come to you with the same question. I mean, um, uh, um, some might argue that uh, this is uh, your fault. You're at the forefront and you're just not speaking up enough about, uh, in the security press, about uh, the good work that's being done. Uh, I can only back that back from my own perspective, Martin, <laughs> uh, without wishing to blow my own trumpet. I mean, over the years, over the, uh, the last 10 years particularly, I was asked to write for uh, organisations like the Evening Standard, uh, the Metro newspaper. Um, I've also attempted to engage with the Times. There was a particular article published in the Times by a, a well-known media personality that was really slating security officers, and I, and I actually batted that back, back in, in more than one occasion as well. Um, I think the key here really is to entice the national media to report on security in a good way uh, and on sensible matters. Very often when you see reporting in the national press, it's, it's for want of a better phrase, on the scurrilous stuff or, or uh, alleged scurrilous stuff, shall we say. Um, I know for many years, and to their great credit, the BSIA have been very prominent in trying to entice the national media to its annual awards, for example. And to my mind, only once in the last 10 years or so, as somebody from a major news broadcast that comes to the events, and I don't think anything happened thereafter. So I don't think it's our fault necessarily. Um, Chuck, um, engage the national media. That seems to be uh, um, uh, a good plan. Realistically, are they going to be interested in what security is doing? What's it like over there in America? Well, it's a, it's a fascinating point, Brian. I think you're spot on there. Um, so I've done about 1,500 interviews in the last five years with security experts all around the world. And my show is inside baseball, admittedly, right? I'm known in the trade shows. I'm known inside the security industry. But I'm not as well known outside that area. Now, having, come, having worked for Fox and Disney and worked directly with their you know, news people and their studios and all their stations around the world, I know that the news cycle is driven by things that are interesting, controversial. It's got to get viewers. And, you know, if a security story about a success about something that didn't happen isn't sexy enough, they're just not interested. And I, I share this frustration. I think we do try to do a good job of getting this information out there. Uh, ironically, uh, when all the trade shows were canceled a few months ago, I said, what are we gonna do? And I was waiting for leadership from some of these trade organizations to say, what's the next step? Nobody really knew what to do. It's, you know, it's not their fault, they're, this is a brand new thing. So I decided I'm just gonna turn on my microphone and do some shows. And within, Martin, within an hour of putting out my calendar, I had 60 people lined up to do shows. So people want to get the word out there in our industry. There's mechanisms for it, but going outside the bubble is very difficult. And uh, I'm not sure what the solution for that is, but it is problematic. And if we're not tooting our own horn, who's going to do that for us? I mean, this is the challenge. Yeah, interesting point. So um, um, tooting the, your own horn, our own horn, I guess, is, is the starting point of it. Let me come to some uh, questions. Uh, I'll come to you first, Andrew, on this from Stuart Naisbitt. Um, and his view is much of what's written about in security publications seems to be mainly about technology. Is it not time to look more at uh, the personnel side? Uh, a question that's um, uh, picked up by other questions as well. Is that your impression that technology is getting uh, more of a news, that more of a, a focus than um, the people side? And if so, is it justified? 
I think uh, definitely technology, it's more exciting, like Chuck was saying, you know, the, 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 the national news coverage or co uh, broadcasters want to cover what's exciting. So, you know, it's better to talk about AI because that gets attention rather than what an, an officer did or didn't do and, uh, and the results thereof. But I think that the coverage of technology also has a positive in that we're seeing technology taking over some of the, if I can call it drudge work or the, or the work of uh, the old security officer and allowing them to expand their scope of operation to more, uh, shall we say, human interest <laughs> uh, areas, you know, uh, things like taking care of people, interacting with people and, and becoming part of the, the solution rather or becoming more personal rather than the guy in the uniform who's watching you all the time. So um, to get back to the question, I've gone off the topic there, but uh, yes, there is a lot more about technology because it's a lot nicer to read about technology than it is about, you know, an officer who's actually just doing their job properly. So um, talking about safety or moving into safety offices, definitely we're seeing that already happening in the private security industry and not in the state uh, uh, industry, uh, authorities uh, industry, but in the private security industry, definitely more people oriented security guards doing the security job, but also doing a people job. Yes, Brian, I guess um, uh, one of the real issues is that, um, as others have said here, that there's nothing very interesting about security. Perhaps technology is the more interesting part. Um, uh, it was suggested to me actually a few years back that what we really got to do is get a security officer's role into one of the soaps. Now, just for Andrew and Chuck and others not from the UK, soaps are a big deal over here, and there's some really um, ones that are on most nights. I'm, I'm sure it's the same the world over. And then what we really need to do is get a good story about what security can do into a soap, because that's the best way of com connecting with the public in a meaningful way. Brian, is that ridiculous or very necessary? I don't think it's ridiculous, Martin. I remember a few years back um, on Coronation Street, there was a story about uh, cameras in the, in, the, uh, in the corner shop on the street. And that was, that was kind of sort of halfway there, I guess. I think what we could do, rather than the soap opera, if you're talking about television, I think we'd be best to go for something like a fly on the wall documentary. You know, I watch, as a busman's holiday, I watch lots of the programmes on the Sky Channel it's about border security and um, immigration and borders. I think something along those lines, a fly on the wall documentary about security officers and the work they do is pretty crucial. And coming back to a point that was made earlier on, um, with the BSI awards, for example, there's nothing more important than what these guys do, in my view, apart from the world economy, and particularly at the moment, obviously, the economy is in, in a bad way. But other than that, it's the biggest topic on the agenda, or should be, for boards of directors in, in this country and elsewhere, security, business resilience, business continuity. I think that's the message that needs to be put forward. And if it doesn't come forward after this crisis, I'm not sure how it will come forward. But I think something that's a fly on the wall documentary about security and what they do, saving lives. That's what you hear at the BSI Awards every year. They save lives in some instances. If that's not national news, then what is? Um, Chuck, uh, fly on the wall documentary about the role of security. Uh, um, doesn't sound overly riveting if you're not interested in the security sector. Or could it be? Well, I have a few stories from my history <laughs> that would probably give it an R rating. I mean, there's some crazy stuff that goes on behind the scenes in security. I agree with this premise, and let me give you the opposite view. Uh, one of my favorite cartoons was Animaniacs back in the 90s. Kids and I used to watch that all day long. One of the main characters in there was a Warner Brothers Studio security guard that was always chasing the Animaniacs around and always failing because he was incompetent. And I got to tell you, that cartoon set the security industry back. It set these stereotypes about a guard backwards. So if it can work backwards, it can work forwards. And I, and I think if we did have these, con these shows out there about this sort of thing, I think they would be very, very helpful. If I could go back to that previous question real quickly. Yeah. Uh, I had my first computer in 1984. I've been on the internet a long time. And around the 90s, when you were doing searches with a 9K modem and you typed in security, you got all the big box companies, Securitas, Pinkerton, all those people came up online, right? And over the years, you type in security now and what comes up? It's all IT security, right? IT stole that word from physical security and they own it. And uh, you know, to your point uh, about the, the technology being sexier, people don't realize this, all internet technology, cybersecurity is based now 
on behavioral analytics, and it's based on the coders and programmers writing some code that says, you know, there's this guy inside our network, he's acting this way, and that means he's the bad guy. And that's based on our physical security model. We've let physical security behavior get away from us and being it's owned by IT, and they're getting all the glory when their models are all based on, quote, physical security. That's unfortunate. Just on the, on the, on the bit of media, um, on the OSPAs that take place around the world, one thing we do is liaise with local um, press about the winners of those awards. And that certainly um, gets people into the local press. Um, how much good it does, we'll, we'll, time will tell. But it is part of that image, isn't it, about successes. And around the world, um, that, that more and more we're finding the press interested in those. Okay, let me move on then. We've got a, um, a good question here from Phil Ingram, changing tack slightly. Can I ask you, if you've got a question, please to put it on the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, so rather than the chat, the question and answer button. Now, Phil Ingram, very well known over here, uh, um, very highly thought of um, 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 uh, uh, commentator on the security sector and uh, plays a similar role to you, Chuck, in many respects in, in America. And Phil's point is that um, if we really want to um, promote the security world, then it's a matter of engaging with national media and national editors in a meaningful way. That there needs to be some sort of strategy, perhaps from the security sector, I'm adding, uh, um, adding a dimension to this. But that um, just to expect uh, national press to take it up and do it is not going to work. It's the same in my world of criminology, I might add, by the way. In fact, my daughter's a journalist, and she was saying in a preparation for, for this uh, webinar that, um, yeah, we're happy to do stories about the police, and that's always of interest, but uh, no one talks about uh, the security sector. No one's that interested, really. Engaging the national press. Andrew, a realistic possibility uh, um, in there in Africa, South Africa, would it make much difference? I don't, honestly, I don't think it would make much difference. Um, just to go back to uh, what some of the other guys were saying, we had a reality uh, show here um, about uh, two years, through three years ago, where a private security company had cameras in their cars and on their, on their, on their offices and followed them around. And it became quite an exciting program for a very short period of time. But uh, it, it kind of eventually just faded out because you know, a lot of the job of a security officer is hurry up and wait. You're not always chasing someone down an alleyway or uh, filming somebody who's selling drugs or something like that. So, you know, the, the, the national media wants something exciting, something groundbreaking. The, you know, this, in South Africa with the crime rates, that's as sky high as we have here. Uh, you know, somebody who's stopping a burglary or, you know, getting someone to hospital in time after they collapse at home, just... You know, there's no story there. Um, if we want to get into the national media, we need to look at, uh, you know, the larger companies actually putting together something which would be of interest. Uh, you know, how many burglaries they've stopped, how many murders they've stopped, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, getting into the sort of the, the brass tacks, if I can use that word, rather than trying to be nice. You know, you have to talk about murders and rapes and stuff like that and what you've done rather than, and obviously that's not a popular thing <laughs> to talk about. Yes, Brian, so, so your thoughts on this. I mean, um, engagement with national media or big companies coming together and uh, um, promoting it that way, your thoughts? Well, just, like, just to um, allude to a previous point, Martin, to, to bring in my next point uh, and the question you've asked. Um, I mean, for many years, uh, you, you'll know I edited a journal called Security Management Today, and um, it was 80%, I think, um, and um, by my own um, work, actually, um, promoting security management and security guarding. It wasn't really about technology. I actually bucked the trend for the best part of a decade. <laughs> so some of us do write about guarding, and some of us do believe in it very strongly. I think one way we can get to a situation where the national media will be engaged is by uh, organizations like the Security Institute. Now, this is going a bit beyond pure security guarding, if you like, and, and the premise of this conversation. But they are um, um, going for chartered status, a chartered professional status akin to lawyers, medicine, uh, engineering, et cetera, et cetera. And once we've got a great cohort of people that are of that level, chartered security professionals, then that's a story to tell in the national media and they should be buying into that. Okay. Um, Chuck, let me just uh, give you a chance to come on this because I think it's a big one. It's about the best ways of engaging the non-security audience. 
And uh, um, uh, you know, some people uh, uh, would argue there is already quite a bit on there. And uh, Brian mentioned border security, and there are various other bits that um, programs about airport security and customs. And um, this idea that we could uh, get the bigger companies and associations to make the case. This idea we need to build up a rapport with the key editors. Um, your thoughts on those two or anything else that takes the message outside the security world? Well, this is a, a very interesting concept and, and I think it's in play. Um, I started the show about five years ago. I use a, a platform called Livestream. So I get feedback on my show and most of my shows are live and I get feedback on demographics. And you know, the show is watched in about 95 countries. I know what browser you're using. I kind of know areas and such. And I'm going to say that my engagement of people watching is not, you know, 99% security personnel. I'm going to say 20% of them are soccer moms or people that re are connected to security, but are interested in security. So there is an interest there. And I don't think we're capitalizing on that. One thing I try to do with my interviews is dumb them down. That's not a great way to say it, but that's what I do or to, for myself, right? So I try to make the interviews, you know, what is the guy across the street going to get out of this? Is he going to understand the concept, not talk, above everybody's head with a bunch of vernacular that's inside baseball. So I think if we make it uh, a conversation with the average person, I think we're gonna get this engagement. And I'll tell you who's gonna drive this. It's not the CEO who's making a buying purchase for security. It's gonna be his circle of non-CEOs or family or friends that say, you know what? You gotta get on board with this. You gotta help protect our neighborhood. Let's bring it down to a local decision not just a corporation. So I think there's hope there. We just have to make it, um, I don't know, more engaging. I, I don't do live on LinkedIn because LinkedIn told me, quote, we don't think security is an interesting enough topic for everybody. Really, especially during COVID-19. Security is not interesting. And the live licenses they do issue to people get five or six views. And when we post a video, we're getting three or 4,000 views, right? So there's this disconnect between what the media thinks is important and interesting and what people find interesting. And Martin, I believe that people find security fascinating and interesting. And that message is being blocked, not intentionally, but perhaps just by, I don't know, financials. So, you know, they're not going to advertise. It's being blocked by the media. They're not, they're not thinking they can make money on that. And the message doesn't get out. But I think the interest is there. Okay, so that's a positive note. Let's um, uh, move on then now. Uh, and an observation made by Paul MacArthur, who's talking about uh, something we were just mentioning before this uh, started. And that's the issue of the fact that uh, we're in an emergency, we're in a crisis. That's a time when um, security shines. Um, what do you think is going to happen when, God willing, we get beyond the crisis and we get back to some sense of normality? Uh, um, is your sense that good work done now will count for something later. Andrew Seldon first. Um, unfortunately, no. <laughs> um, I don't think it will count for much later on. Um, this is the, the whole sort of COVID lockdown, or, or we're in lockdown here, but uh, other places like uh, Chuck, Arizona, where Chuck is, you're not in lockdown, but um, it's going to be seen as, you know, what happened during the crisis or what happened during the pandemic and as soon as it's over and as soon as if we can get back to business as usual or as close to that as possible, I think the, the attitudes are, and, and, and the, the kind of the opinions of people are going to revert to the way they were, you know, no, no more COVID. So, you know, let's get back to what we were and ignore what we were ignoring and hope for the best kind of thing. Brian, um, is security going to come out of this with uh, um, its reputation enhanced in stake and we're going to get a magic moment of awareness of the sorts of things you've been writing about for decades? Well, I hope it does, Martin. I mean, I, I fervently hope it does. I mean, that was a, 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 the point I alluded to earlier on about the, the push for critical worker status among several organisations is absolutely crucial and key. Um, that needs to be, we need to make hay, uh, if one's a better phrase, with that now and, and going forward because this, this is the, the, the industry's chance to shine. And it's protecting, you know, millions of pounds of the businesses out there. And going forward, that's going to be crucial for business, particularly ones that are struggling now under this current climate. If, they, if we can entice those clients, for example, to say, look, the industry's done a great job for us, you know, in this particularly bad time, then the, the, I guess the, the, the forward shining light will come thereafter. 
you're optimistic it will I think it will, but I, but I think it's going to take effort on our part, on the part of the industry in general. And I do agree with the point that Philip's made on the Q and A, Philip Ingram. We should be talking about security holistically. I don't I don't think it's 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 prescient or correct to talk about the, the splitting out of guarding and, and and systems, for example. The talk in the last few years has all, all been about convergence, uh, security convergence, bringing the IT and the physical together. And I think that's where we should be going from now on. Uh, um, Chuck, your thoughts. Well, Brian, I agree 100%. Security's always been both. Physical, the separation of security between physical and IT is, is kind of poppycock. I mean, it's all about people and protection. So I'm going to say this in a way that's going to sound negative, but in a way I think it's positive. Uh, and the UK, I think, has a much better security model. You have some national standards. We don't have that here. It might be impossible with 50 different states. You take security more seriously in a way. When I say security, I mean the, let's say, the guarding industry, for example. What's happening over here? Well, the answer is nothing's happening over here. Nobody's riding in the streets. We, we have buildings that are closed and locked. I'm not seeing security guards in front of these empty buildings. I'm seeing less security on the streets than ever. And personally, uh, friends of mine in the industry have been laid off. And I'm not talking security guard level. I'm talking high level people going, dude, how, how could you get laid off? You're the head of security. Nothing's going on. There's no need for security. So I think we run the risk of coming out of this as being not as necessary. Let me give you a quick story. When I was at Fox, the head of the studio came to my boss and said, I see your budget. You're asking for a 10% increase. Yeah. Well, if I gave you a 10% increase, can you guarantee me nothing would be stolen or we wouldn't have any problems? My boss says, no, I can't guarantee that. The studio, the head of the studio said, okay, cut your security force by 50%. And guess what? He did it. And guess what happened? Nothing. Nothing bad happened. This is the danger we're in. We're doing a good job of security right now. It's behind the scenes, under the radar. Nothing's happening negative. There's an assumption, perhaps, that security's not engaged. But in fact, behind the scenes, we're keeping it together. So we run the risk, I think, of coming out of this, not in a negative light, but in a neutral position where security is seen as well, I cut my budget and nothing happened. And that's that's a danger going forward for the next big thing on the horizon we don't know about. Interesting point. And Mike Cummings has raised a question that slightly overlaps this, uh, um, building on your point, uh, Chuck, where he's, he's really saying that uh, maybe the security world, the work of security world is not so interesting for those outside of it to be realistic. But it needs to develop a different way of presenting it. Maybe through the use of metrics to show that it's got a demonstrable uh, return on investment and added value. Um, and that uh, the key there is to show, yes, we're having a real impact and you get the news through that route. Uh, Andrew, your thoughts on that? I have to agree with that, uh, especially uh, in the physical security world. And I'm talking specifically South and Southern Africa right now. Uh, you know, the cyber security or, or information security people get to talk to the board and to the, the senior executives in the company. But the physical security guys are like the, the guys in the back room or in the basement, which, you know, they're just supposed to do stuff and not be seen. And when these guys start telling their story and, and telling people what they do and what they've done and what successes they've had in terms of uh, getting people who are, you know, lurking or loitering in the parking lot, getting rid of them and things like that, suddenly people start uh, uh, looking up and saying, oh, so you actually do something. It's like Chuck was saying, you know, nothing happened when they fired 50% of the security staff. Uh, when you actually, when the physical security guys actually tell them what they're doing and make as much noise as the cybersecurity guys, people start realizing that, you know, that they need to talk to these guys. They need to be involved. They need to actually know what's going on and bring these people in into, at the higher levels in the company. Brian, an important point. I'm interested to get your thoughts on um, uh, uh, on this issue, on really, really how we make the most of what's happening now for the benefit of what goes afterwards. I mean, realistic is is it going to make a difference? Chuck's sceptical. I think the key point to note here, Martin, it's something that you and I have discussed over many years, actually, and we've disagreed on. I think on, on numerous occasions as well. The key point of this issue is getting the message through to boards of directors, in, as far as the UK is concerned, boards of directors in UK PLC. These are the people with the purse strings. Now, very often the, the issue these days when the security guarding company, for example, goes into tender for a contract, they're not necessarily meeting somebody who is either au fait with security or indeed a security professional. 
They're sometimes talking to a generalist FM or perhaps a, uh, a procurement chat, something along those lines. And then it becomes a pounds and pence exercise. That is when you're on a slip, slippery slope, I would suggest. I think the message, and uh, to, to its credit, the SIA over the years, the regulator has been doing a lot of um, work in, in enticing the end user community into to buying into regulation, if you if you want, for a better one of the best phrase. Um, it, it's worked, I think, to a certain degree, but I think now is the time, as I say, once the COVID pandemic is passing and companies realise that, well, hey, this company has saved X millions of pounds potentially on stock not being stolen, et cetera, due to the security that's on site, the contracted in security or the in-house security, whichever it happens to be. Once we've got that, that, that's when you can actually show a return on their investment. They have to be persuaded that security is a, a business enabler for them. And it's something that they can put onto the bottom line as a business enabler. That's what we've got to do. I think that's the key message coming out of this now. Okay, here's a good question from uh, uh, Michael Gibbs, um, uh, um, who says, this discussion raises a key point. Whether security journalists, and I'll include all of you in this, or people who present the security, are security ambassadors first, or journalists first? Andrew. Yeah, that's actually a very good question. Um, I've, you have to actually play both roles. Um, you have to play the journalist role where you're providing information that's relevant to the industry. But at the same time, because we are focused on a specific industry, we also need to look at, uh, imp not improving, but uh, highlighting the, the good points of the industry, you know, sort of uh, blowing your own, or blowing the security industry's trumpet to say, you know, these guys actually know what they're doing and they're doing a good job and this is what they've done. And this, these are the results they've had. So yes, a bit of yes on both accounts, but without you know, being an ambassador, without becoming uh, just basically a, a mouthpiece or a PR uh, mechanism for it. So I think both are important, especially in the security industry where, and the state it is in right now. Uh, I guess, Brian, good question for you too. Um, are you a security journalist first or are you a, sorry, you're a journalist first or are you a security ambassador first? Well, uh, winding the clock back 30 years when I started in journalism, Martin, I was a journalist. I was a journalist writing about a topic that happened to be in front of me. I would like to think for the last 20 years, I've been a security professional first and foremost and a journalist second. Um, I do genuinely believe that. That's why I, I back to the hilt, the security industry uh, authority. Uh, and particularly the Security Institute chartered status. That's my key goal. That's my raison d'etre, my vocation. What, what, I, what I do this job for, essentially. It's not a job to me. It's more of a vocation. I want to see security management and security guarding recognise what it is, which is a genuine profession. OK. Uh, um, Chuck, I guess you're... Would you consider yourself a security ambassador first, purely because of your background? You no, know, I'm going to I'm going to use a different word, I, and I, I and I don't consider myself a journalist. I know that mm. sounds weird, but I I never viewed it that way. I consider myself an evangelist, right? I'm on a soapbox and I'm out there preaching that we need to take this stuff seriously. We need to get engaged, and that's my view. I I think that by giving people a form to get out there and say what they think about security, and you know you see my show, you've been on my show, Martin. It's very open, like yours. We're going to have a discussion. We're not going to go sell your product. We're going to go sell you, right? And what you can do for a solution. So I'm, I'm going to say, I'm an evangelist. I'm passionate about this thing. And I think that carrying that with the journalism behind you can be effective. Okay, thank you. And I've got um, two points made here that I'm going to pick up. from um, First from uh, Jennifer uh, Ciolfi. I hope I sp I've pronounced that right, Jennifer. Um, who says cyber security gets movies like Hackers and the Net, in brackets not to date myself, she says. We, we get uh, Paul Blart, Mall Cop. How do we contribute to changing this? And uh, Dr. Janice uh, Goldstraw White, a colleague of mine in uh, perpetuity, says there is a recurring character of Barry Biglow, who is the head of security for fictional university campus on the soap Doctors. There are some common health and safety jibes but it does show a varied and human side of such a role as it's often involved in many diverse stories. So um, let me ask this to each of you if I could. Uh, um, what do we need to do um, with the security press? How do we get the, the press, not the security press, the press, engaged in shaping opinions about the security sector? 
in a way that is meaningful for them and has the potential to show up the enormous possibilities for good when done well and indeed perhaps the dangers of badness when not done well in other words there's a real value in good security as opposed to bad security uh, brian you first please i think in a very short answer Martin, i think many of us have been doing that for many years now in fairness well, so you say, I mean, nothing needs to be done. We're doing fine, thanks. Well, there's always something that can be done. I mean, potentially something that uh, what we could do is organise a, a forum, for example, that brought together all of the key journalists in the UK. Um, that might be something that entices the national media to visit, for example, certainly the home affairs correspondents of the national newspapers, and debate it, just debate security as a topic uh, in a post-COVID world. Well, I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, uh, there we are. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, Andrew? I think what we have to do is, is put a human face on security, um, get the statistics out there and talk about how your know, people's lives have been impacted by efficient and good security and talk about how people's lives could have been impacted if they were able to have access to good and efficient security. I don't think, you know, just talking about it is, is, is going to create much uh, interest or, or get much attention or following because the, the, the press out there wants to talk about things of human interest that'll you know get the, the, the eyes on the page or the eyes on the screen rather than talk about things that uh, actually matter in the long run so we need to be human interest and a little more exciting with a few more statistics out there about what the benefits of what we're doing. Andrew would you say that in South Africa uh, uh, there's a good relationship between the security press, just thinking generally for a moment, and uh, um, the non-security press. I mean, is there any type of relationship, any type of uh, uh, interaction between the two? Um, no, basically not. <laughs> I mean, there are certain uh, interactions now and then for specific reasons, but in general, uh, they don't know the security uh, media exists, which is kind of sad. Yeah, okay. Uh, um, and let me come to you, Chuck. Uh, um, Biggie, this. Uh, your thoughts? So you hit on a, a key word here. You said, you know, what are the, I think the word was, uh, you know, the opinions. <clears throat> the great thing about security is we don't need opinions. We have a lot of facts, right? And to Andrew's point, statistics can be factual. One thing the press does is a very poor job of putting facts out there when it comes to security. You know, they're, they're going to put out some, this drives me nuts on a TV show. Uh, you know, they, they do procedures during a security segment or a police segment that's completely wrong. I read something the other day in a police journal that called a burglary a robbery. Two different things, right? So if we're going to, if we're going to have the wrong facts out there about our industry and we don't correct them, we're going to create a stereotype for our industry that is going to become not interesting when the facts are it's a fascinating industry. It's fact-driven. It's one of the few industries that facts rule the day, and you make decisions for life or death based on facts, not on, I'm going to take a guess at that, right? So I think that's where we could improve this. Uh, you know, with when somebody does something incorrectly and makes a false statement, we correct them with the facts. I think that's the key to moving that forward. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your insights and your observations. I mean, what uh, uh, um, I found particularly striking is that, of course, all three of you have been uh, great supporters of the security sector and uh, um, in many ways have driven uh, um, interest through acting as focal points and outlets for all that's good about security. And one of the problems we all face, I think, is how we harness that for a broader audience. And what many of you have said in questions and in previous webinars, and all three of you touched on today, is the security sector has been rather better at talking to itself. And yet, as a business enabler, as a key protector of the public, as a uh, key uh, uh, focal point for many things that are good, um, it's been appallingly bad about speaking up for itself and saying how good it is. Um, so my thanks to the three of you for your uh, uh, interesting and engaging observations. Um, and just to let you know, uh, we will have a copy of uh, this webinar on our website, on the OSPAS website, and it will also be available on our Security and Crime YouTube channel so that uh, you can go back and refer to it. We will be 
actually picking up some of these issues in webinars we're doing later this week. Uh, um, on uh, uh, Thursday, uh, the topic is security and technologies. Uh, so we look forward to um, um, speaking to our international audience about whether technology is being a positive or a negative. Uh, um, and tomorrow, uh, uh, we have a very unusual uh, uh, and different webinar. Uh, um, our good friend Rajiv Martha has put together an interesting panel on private security and COVID-19 in India, where we've got an Indian-based uh, uh, um, uh, panel uh, with um, um, Simon Pears from Sudetsko joining as an international commentator, where we can find out what's been going on in one country, one country that has faced very uh, specific and uh, general problems. So um, please do uh, look at those. Uh, don't forget that um, in security, uh, uh, the key point today is about speaking up about the good. And we would encourage you worldwide to look at engaging with the OSPAs, the Outstanding Security Performance Awards. Um, uh, these are uh, um, these are open. These are about to, to, to open or about to be judged in different countries. So um, uh, please do spread the word. Please do encourage people to enter. Uh, uh, it's vital that we identify who's outstanding so that we can take it forward. Um, our very special thanks to our supporters who um, have been uh, um, key to making these webinars happen. Uh, I would particularly like to thank uh, um, two people in the background who are the real brains behind this. Uh, um, um, I'm just a, the front piece, uh, but I'm grateful to um, uh, Christine Brooks and uh, Heather Miller. And of course, to all of you around the world who join in and offer your insights, offer your thoughts and pay such close attention to the issues. Um, uh, um, I'm, I'm very grateful to the panel once again. Um, uh, as always, international, engaging experts and speak up. Uh, um, wherever you are in the world, please stay safe. And if you can join the Indian panel, it's at 11 a.m. BST tomorrow, so a different time. Uh, hopefully you can join that. If not, let's, hopefully we'll see you on Thursday, back to the normal time, 3.30 British summer time. Uh, until then, thank you very much indeed and stay safe.